unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Come on, speak in other tongues. So tell him, "Ara la 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 Speaking of the tongues, Sunta Rabba Kusha la 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 la. Father, we worship you. 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 Father, we give you all the glory. Father, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory.
the name of Jesus.
in moments like these. Sing a new song. Sing a new song. For Jesus. In moments like these, I sing. Sing a new song, oh man. Somebody sing that ten in the moment. Sing a new song. Sing a new song.
Thank you for what you're about to speak to us today. We must decrease and you must increase, God. Take over, take control, God. Take charge. This evening, minister to your people. In Jesus' mighty name, we've prayed and believed. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Something wonderful is going to happen. It's important I have you sober now. So that by the end of service, it doesn't matter where you go. Hallelujah. At the end of service, it doesn't matter where you what? Where you go. But it's important to have you sober now. And all saints say, Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1. 
Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1. The Bible says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me toward you, or which is given me to you, what? Right? How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, and whereby when you read, ye may know or understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy prophets and apostles, or his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And he says, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. And he says, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. Not by faith in him, but by the faith of him. Somebody say amen. amen. Say, say it again, say amen. Now, let me begin this way. When the Bible says that God went to Paul and he begins his letter as a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to explain that further, what he means to be a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Some of you, you are just um, believers in Jesus. But I want to explain what it means to be a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Somebody say Amen. You have heard of the dispensation of grace of God which is given unto me toward you. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery read of four in a few words. And he says, whereby when you read, you will know my understanding in that uh, mystery. Are we together? That you'll understand what I know in that very mystery. And he says, which in the ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Let me begin this way. The progression of knowledge is not that in every generation, necessarily, every generation knows. That's just one part of it. The progression of revelation is that in every generation, God gives them what they need to operate and survive and exist. I don't know if I'm making sense. In other words, God just doesn't give every generation what they must know only. That's an understatement. He takes time to give men what he knows they need in that generation. And that progression means that there are things that are simply not given to certain men because either they don't need them or because it's not by divine appointment for them to access them. I don't know that I'm making sense. The mind of God, eternal purpose, has a broader picture that always casts Light on God's eternal purpose in every generation. And therefore, in every generation, whether you're dealing in the generation of which, how, how he dealt with certain men in every covenant they made, right? Or you're dealing with God in how he dealt with them, with the distinctions of operation in every generation, according to every covenant made, it means that there are things the people of old did not know simply because it was not simply for them to know. I don't know that I'm making sense. It was not for them to know. They could do anything. They could seek God. They could pray about it like Peter says, that of which salvation was spoken of in the prophets of old. And the Bible says, and they searched out diligently with all their hearts what manner 
of, 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 of things that was coming and what the Spirit of Christ did signify about this whole death and resurrection of Christ. And he says, and to whom it was revealed. He says that it was not unto them that they did minister those things. But he says, but unto us they did minister those things. They didn't receive revelation that profited them. What they received was for a future event. And that is why God could not fill them in fully about the questions they had in that dispensation. I don't know if I'm making sense. God could not fully reveal grace in a certain generation before Christ had come. Are we together? And therefore, the progression of knowledge is that he gives knowledge to every generation as that generation needs according to his divine purpose. Now, if a man lives in that generation and the knowledge he has is for a past generation, then man will not have effect in that generation. If a man in that generation receives what is not given in that generation, the first one was receiving an all kind of thing. The second one was receiving what is not given by God in that particular generation. That man still will be amiss. The gifts can work on him, everything can work, but it's only a matter of time. There are things that weigh us against divine purpose. And God blesses divine purpose. I don't know if I'm making sense. I don't know if I'm making sense. So at the end of the day, it's important for every man to be in tune with what God says. So when he says that in the last days knowledge shall be increased, what does that mean? It means that there's a deliberate mind for him to increase knowledge for every generation because that's what they need. So God expects us to know more than Paul knew. Paul, listen, is our foundation. He's not our standard. Can I say it again? The Apostle Paul is our foundation, not our standard. He says like a master builder, he says I've what? I've built it. The Lord gave him the grace to lay down the foundation like a master builder. But he says take heed how you build. Men don't live in foundations. Men live in finished buildings. I don't know if I'm making sense. What was on Paul was simply to lay the foundation. And another man was supposed to take over and build further. When men listen to us, we are supposed to sound, operate, even move in the spirit deeper than Paul did. He knows that. Because that's the transition of knowledge. Because as the church in general continues to behold like in the mirror the glory of God, what happens? We are translated every other day to the very image, the full stature and the full measure of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The same image. And he says when that image illuminates on us, he says we come from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So I believe in me that you are a demonstrator of Christ even more than Paul was. Or at least there is a mutual expectation in agreement with God that we ought to move deeper than they moved. Look at the patterns of the Spirit. Jesus is touched and he heals. Are you hearing me? Peter comes on board and his shadow heals. Paul comes later and the Bible says that when he prayed for hunkies, And then he gave them to them which were sick and them which were possessed by devils. The Bible says they left them. Now, if Jesus was touched and virtue went out of him, if if Peter healed by the shadow and Paul healed by the hunky, 2016 is supposed to be another thing. It's supposed to be another thing. So, why I believe in my spirit, even in my own meditation, I am believing God for the craziest things. Last Thursday, a young man called me and told me he had a blind mother in the United States. And while we were praying for, I don't know where the guy is around. We were praying for the sick. And he says, he told his mother, can you see? The mom's eye opened. Where is the guy? I don't know that he's around. He he sent me an email and told me my mom's eye opened. I don't know that the guy is around. Is he around? Stand up and they see you. Hey, you're a lady. Hey, wave so they know. Now, when they were sending healing, do you know what she said? She said, God. I'm arresting healing right now for my mother. Because I know proximity is not access. I can access anybody. Oh, yeah, Rabakote Lemande Costa. Rabakaye Costa. 
And then she tells me, no, my mom can see now. There was nothing. You see, you don't limit God. Tell anybody you don't limit God. Tell him again. Tell him you don't limit God. Tell him one more time. Tell him you don't limit God. He can do anything. So when you talk about faith in 2016, when you're talking about the faith of 2,000 years ago, it's all the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But we carry a different evidence now. What we see in the spirit is different from what Paul saw. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You're seeing something deeper. We are literally building the church. We are giving the church shape. We're giving it character. We're giving it size. We're giving it tenacity. We're giving it identity. We're giving it description. It's how they are. It's how they are. Years ago it was hard to get educated people here. On a weekday. How? We are busy. We have children. They have to do homework. Right? You understand? But right now there is a mother who left her children. She's praying in tongues that they do it well. Why? Because she needs... You're not just paying a price for you. You're paying a price for your children and your children's children. By grace. Why? Because he has enabled us to. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Somebody say, I'm going far. Say it again and say, I am going far. In the name of Jesus. So, I have learned to appreciate the progression of knowledge and the things God has to send because of the time that we are in. When sin increased, grace abounded more. But grace cannot abound simply in signs, miracles, and wonders. It has to abound in knowledge. It has to abound in knowledge. And in all judgment, the Bible says that we may examine the things most excellent and that we might not have offense on the day of Christ. That offense does not come because you lied or, 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 or stole. No, you're past that. That offense comes because there is a responsibility that was given you by reason of the things God is pouring out on you. We can't run from that responsibility. To whom much is given, much is required. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. And he says, because of that stuff revealed by revelation, he says, of which now, he says, I made a minister. Now, just to the beginning of the minister. The beginning of the minister is what God has revealed in that man. And then after that, that man becomes a minister. Not just the gifts operating on my life. No. The beginning of ministry is the revelation of Jesus Christ. When we heal the sick, we are just serving God. Right? But when, when, when we go past just that healing to ministry, it, it oh, I, I don't know whether you understand. Every healing is a sermon. It's not just the testimony of a healed person. I told people, look at Jesus. Jesus just never healed. Jesus healed and every healing taught. Every healing taught. He just never used to heal. No. That is why when we get into the testimony of his healings, we teach through that and heal the sick. When you mature into that, that's when you realize the beginning of ministry. You're not just a worshipper to sing a wonderful song. No. You're a worshipper because out of it there is going to be a ministry. A revelation of Jesus Christ. You're a teacher because out of it there is going to be a revelation of Jesus Christ. You, you have to intercede to a level. Well, you're not, you're not praying because you're an intercessor. No. You're praying because when you pray, Christ is revealed. When you serve an usher and you're helping people sit down, even as you do it, people see Christ. That is ministry. I don't know if I'm making sense. That is why every healing that the Christ operated on has a divine teaching to it. Little girl, rise up. Talitha Kumai. Right? And the Talit there in the Hebrew, right, is, you know, that cloth that had scriptures on it. So it's more of one which is wrapped out in the word, come out. You know, as that which is wrapped up in the heart 
Even though it's asleep, it cannot die because it's wrapped in the world. See, everything is casting the nets on the right hand, which is the ministration of grace. It's two fish and five loaves of bread, right? The distinction of the dual covenant and the ministration of grace. Every miracle of the Christ is a teaching to the church. So, Jesus just didn't go to heal to show that he had power. I don't know, I don't know you understand what I'm saying. Jesus was not just healing to show power. So, even when Paul was walking with the Lord, and signs, miracles, and wonders were happening, they were not simply happening. For somebody to say, wow, you're a believer in Jesus, and these signs, miracles, and wonders are following you, yes. But they come with a certain responsibility. That in the end, when we manifest these things, Christ is revealed. Salvation comes to men. Somebody say, Amen. Jairus' daughter, the man with legion. Every miracle, the Roman centurion, how he saw no greater faith. And then that's when we get the revelation of what it means to send the word. And the power of the word to be sent to produce the results that is necessary. Every miracle is a teaching. Every miracle is a teaching. Every prophetic word that man spoke was a sermon. That is... If, if our teaching is only limited in the words we speak, then we've not yet begun. We've not yet begun. And that is why the Spirit of God has to teach you to take on a certain form in the Spirit. Because if you don't take on a certain form in the Spirit, the Bible says you cannot commend yourself to the consciences of men. The consciences of men carry judgments. There, there are things people see, they might not say them, but they judge. Some people think that all people are foolish, but they're not. It's like you can disqualify a minister and say, I don't believe in that guy. I don't believe in him. I don't believe in him. I don't think even he's, he's a man of God. I don't, you know. But you see, and people will still come. <laughs> they say, no, we're going we're gonna to make sure. We're gonna make, and then people still come. Why? Because you can't fool everybody. And it doesn't mean that people who are seated... Who come to meetings are ignorant men. Point of information. They are just not on the pulpit. You know we are saints when we got pulpits, whichever we had, either the platform itself or social media or whatever we had, we saw that when we had pulpits, we saw that we had access to the hearts of men. But that is different. We commend ourselves to the consciences of every man in the sight of God. They, we, you must have an ability to minister to that man as the physical representation of everything that you're doing. Some of you minister to people without even saying anything. Without even saying anything. There are some people they just look at them and they bless you. You, you, you say they're talking about me. Say they're talking about you. Tap your neighbor and tell them they are talking about me. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. What has he done? He has shined in our hearts to give the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. There is something that is illuminating out of your spirit. But when people see they say, this is God in the face of Jesus. If Jesus was black, he had to look like you. Hey, can I say it again? If he was black, he had to look like you. Because those imitations are not physical forms. No. Those imitations are not physical forms. When it talks about the image we carry in him, this is not a physical image. It's a spiritual image. Demons don't behold us physically. No, they behold us spiritually. The Bible says that we regard no man in the flesh. Even the Christ which was supposed to be regarded. He's not regarded anymore in the flesh, but in the spirit. When we walk in the spirit, we compare spiritual things with spiritual things. You're more than a man. I said you're more than a man. Can I say it again? You're more than a man. There was a time people never used to hunger to be like Christ. They just wanted to be good Christians. Hard workers with successful 
careers and degrees. But that has changed now. That has changed now. People want to walk with God. People want to be exactly like Him. And, and that is why this generation... Uh, people are in trouble. You're not a preacher, but you demonstrate power. You're not on the pulpit, but you walk in the Spirit. You walk in the Spirit. How can we fail? Wow, you see? That's why I like the way you ask it. Because you're convinced of the things that accompany salvation. In the name of Jesus. What you feed on, you start to become. What you get aware of every Thursday, it starts to eat you up a certain way. It starts to. It starts to. It starts to. Somebody was telling me that and said, Apostle, me back in the day I used to get worried. But now, I am worried that I don't worry. I say, praise God, that's a good testimony. Some of you never used to sleep. Where am I going to get food? Am I going to eat? Will I get tuition? Will my thing? I don't know whether it will go through. Oh my God, come out through for me, or else I die. You understand? But now people don't even understand why you talk the way you talk. Because you talk a certain way. You talk a certain way. You talk a certain way. And every time you're feeding yourself, you watch. Watch in a few years. Watch in a few years. Watch in a few years. No man has fed on this thing and stayed the same. No. He says they are life to them that find them and medicine to their bodies. Divine health is ours. Not just healing, but divine health. It is ours. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Now, look at how Christ is to Paul. He says, he came by revelation and made known unto me the mystery. There was an experience of apocalypsis. Unveiling certain things. The transition of this man experiencing and working with God was every other day he was opening stuff for the man to see. This dispensation is not a dispensation that needs to know about God. This dispensation is a dispensation that needs to know God. There's a difference. We don't gather information about him and then just speak what we know about him. No. We gather him. We put him inside us. And then after that, we start to give information of what we have touched, tested, and seen. The Bible says concerning the word of life. 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 The maturity is coming back in the church. Where you're going to find average men who know too much. And they'll be stable too. Why? Because they are paying the price for it. The grace is available. I say the grace is available. The grace is available. Somebody say amen. The grace is available. So, I carry an experience where the beginning of revelation is God unveiling. God unveiling. Imagine a man who doesn't know Jesus that way. Who just receives information. Every week, they just write notes. But when they are writing, they don't carry the evidence, the experience of things unveiling before them. It only means that that man will know too much of what he cannot show. He will know too much of what he cannot show. And that is where many of us as a body of Christ are coming from. There was a time many people were speaking things they didn't. And I've realized that over the years... It's more not of so much of the learning, but the unlearning of what we learned the wrong way. Every time I hear, it's just stuff that we were taught the wrong way. So I realize how seriously this spirit of deception was. Because we lived in a time where we didn't understand even God. And men fainted. Men fainted and died spiritually. And many ministers, many of us ministers, wasted people's time. The simple look back and say, but 
Why did I why did I invest in that thing? Okay, I loved God, but why that one? I, I don't know whether I'm making sense. But thank God is changing it. Thank God is changing it. So Sometimes even the debates that we go through, the trials, the fights, the contentions between the body of Christ are simply around, and I'll never forget this, they are always around between men to whom Christ is revealed and to those who just know about him. I don't know if that making sense. There are, there, are, there are people who know about Jesus and there are people who know Jesus. You understand? There are people who call upon the one they know about. And there are people who call upon the one they know. There is a difference. When you call the one you know, he must come up. He must come up. And he says, of that cause then I was made a minister. I was made a minister. That's where I began from. That's why I love the way Paul begins in 1 Corinthians 9.1. He says, Am I not an apostle? Comma. He's, he first introduces himself as. Give me the first verse. He says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Am I, have I not seen Jesus? Are you not my work in the Lord? Are you seeing how it goes? Firstly, he carries the office of the apostle. Right? And then after that, he is free. Right? And then after that, he sees the Lord Jesus. And then the work is manifested. His labors are manifested. But you see, I like that in all of whether he was the apostle or he was free, he saw the Lord. He saw the Lord. And what does the next verse say? The next verse says, If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless, he says, I am to you for the sin of mine apostleship, i.e. in the Lord. Now, he says, certain people are in God because of what's upon him. I don't know whether you see the beginning of a minister. Where some people are born again because of you. Uh Ah, you're not born. we We are born again because of Jesus. Yes. But God puts a certain seal on certain men whereby by the grace that he has bestowed upon you. Certain men know him. He says, I be not an apostle unto others. Yet doubtless, he says, I am to you for the seal of mine apostleship. I ye in the Lord. Me, stopping being an apostle. Certain people fall. You stop be, stopping to be who you are. Some people can die. You're actually alive because of some people. And some people are alive because of you. They have the reason to wake up and pray because of you. They have the reason to work tomorrow because of you. She has the reason to drive back to the guy who beat her last night because there are certain words you told her during day and you told her, don't give up. Don't give up. Oreba kateleba. And that's what seals us in God. I say that's what seals us in God. And that's what I believe. So, behind every man, listen, behind every man, there ought to be certain people that approve the seal upon your life. When the Bible speaks of us bringing our sheets to the Lord, we're not going to take money to God. He's not a God who needs money. When he tells us to bring our sheets, he's not talking about cars that we made in this world. No. He's talking about our true reward, souls. He's talking about our true reward, souls. That day when we face him and say, God, we preached the gospel. And these are the people we want for you. In the name of Jesus. And the Bible says that's the beginning of wisdom. When a man can multiply the spirit operating on him to produce the same results. Hallelujah. Now, God... Has, you might not be an apostle, but you carry a seal on your life. There ought to be somebody who worships because they had you worship. There has to be a guy who is inspired to, 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 to play the guitar because when they see you playing it, they see Jesus. They see Jesus. 
And that's why you must understand, many people are too human conscious. They don't understand their influence in the spirit. That is why you can never minister fully to a man until you have commended, like I said, yourself to the man's conscience. You have introduced yourself a certain way to him. When the devil come in dreams, or these spirits that attack people in dreams, they appear like anybody. They take on the form of anybody. Are you hearing me? But that's illegal for them too. That's illegal for them too. But it's accessible for us if it is for the glory of God to minister. Paul would not have gone to Macedonia if a certain form of man didn't appear to him in the spirit calling him. But I believe that there was a man in Macedonia who needed a certain message, but he didn't know who had it. And the prayer of that saint, speaking in tongues, the Bible speaking of how a man, when he speaks in tongues, he edifies himself and he builds himself up in the Lord. It carried a form of influence in the spirit realm to represent himself to the right spirit. And Paul says that I was in the night and I saw a man in Macedonia calling us. That is how Paul received the Macedonian call. And he goes in Macedonia and he says, Brethren, no church communicated to us like the church in Macedonia. For they did not only uh, uh, communicate as was expected, but beyond even their expectation, they gave all and gave themselves unto the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So, the church in Macedonia thrived above any church, whether Corinth, whether Philippe, whether Colosse, whether Thessalonica, whether Rome. Why? Because it began from a spiritual experience. But imagine if this man came to Paul and Paul was falsely misrepresented. Did I mean that he was not misrepresented in the spirit? No. Of course, some spirit forged an identity of him. And that is why I say, some say that we say that we should do evil so good should come whose damnation is just. He preaches and heals the sick and a man comes and says he has defamed the altar. He has defamed against the law of Moses. Of course, there are certain people in which senses you might be misrepresented to them. But that is because you're not called to them. Read the scriptures. There was no man who misunderstood Paul and was Gentile. Any man who misunderstood him was Jew. And no Jew misunderstood Peter. Why? Because he was called to the uncircumcised Paul as Peter was called to the circumcised. That's the beginning of fellowship. He says, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Oneness in the spirit begins when a man understands his true assignment, not just a gifting. And that is why when Paul, Peter leaves that and then goes healing shadows in Rome, he dies. Because God did not call him to Rome. And sometimes the problem is simple. He was raised in Jerusalem, right? So he gets uncomfortable in the Jews and then he wants to shift to the Gentiles. Paul was raised in the Gentiles and then he gets uncomfortable in Tarsus. And then he wants to get into the Jews. Because when we grow, we want to change certain things. But maybe, just maybe, you're Ugandan because God knew. You needed to do something in this land before you went to America. That's why I told our guys, I told them, for us, let us start from here. The world will come to us. I say the world will come to us in the name of Jesus. There's a reason why I had a name that is Ugandan. There's a reason why my passport is Ugandan. Me, I can't change, I can't change nationality. I change, uh, uh, it's okay for you to change it for the sake of the gospel. But don't just change it because you want social welfare. Because you, you, you carry an inheritance <laughs> that cannot be corrupted and faded away. We're even spoiling our little children. We're lying to them that by going to America, you're going to be a success. No. You're not a success because you go to America. 
you're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You will make it here. Tell your neighbor, you will make it here. Go to America for purpose. And holiday. Go to America for purpose and what? And holiday. Let's build Uganda. Tell your neighbor, let's build Uganda. Tell him again, let's build our nation. All the right, all the deep guys are living. And then they wonder why the other nations are developing. Hallelujah. But they will come back. <laughs> they will come back. Not in a bad way, no. We shall develop more than where they are. <laughs> That's why I told God, I believe in my time. To hear white men saying, they denied me the visa of Uganda. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, I believe to see. <laughs> hey! Are you hearing where I'm coming from? We're believing God for that. We are believing God for that. We are believing God every other day. That is why I tell our saints... Don't just pray small prayers. Mukama, hey, fees this time. Oh, they have delayed to pay us. When you're with your wife, hold her hand and tell her, let's take over, let's occupy. Father, we thank you for the Uganda. In the name of Jesus, our children are well. They are safe. They are going somewhere. There will be a blessing in this land. In the name of Jesus, more minerals are going to be discovered. In the name of Jesus, one day we shall not stand in dust and mud. In Kampala, we shall walk on paved stones. In Jesus' mighty name. Somebody has to believe. Somebody has to believe. Somebody has to believe. Why? Because we have a mandate. We have a mandate. Tell your neighbor, we have a mandate. Vamos a you. Christ is revealed. Me, when I'm in my closet, I wish you were there. I look at my mirror and I say, that's the most anointed guy in the world. He's the deepest teacher I've ever had. Me, I tell myself, even you, when you go in the mirror, say I'm the deepest banker there is. Nobody has a brain than I. Bruce says he's looking for me. The banks in Rome might class because they need me. That's who we are. And he says, of which I'm made a minister. Why? Because my primary responsibility is simple. To make them see what I saw. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me reveal to you an irresistible attraction. Hmm? The thing by which we are made attractable or attractive, right? The Bible says, the word of God, Hebrews 4.12, you know it, is a double-edged sword. It's a what? It's a double-edged sword. Now I'll give the amplified. For the word of God is quick and active. It's alive. The word that God speaks is alive and full of power. Making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. He says, it is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the divine line, dividing line of the breath of life, soul, and the immortal spirit, and of joints and marrow, out of the deepest parts of our nature. And he says, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. Now, listen to the next line. The next line says, and not a creature exists that is concealed from his sight. That means the word sees all. But all things are open, exposed, naked, and defenseless. They can't defend themselves in the presence of the word. I don't know whether you understood what it meant. 
Do you know what it means to carry something that makes men defenseless? Somebody say, I carry it. Say it again. Say, I carry it. You carry something that is deep. It, it, it makes all things defenseless. That means they have no choice but to follow you. That is why the signs, miracles, they just follow. Why? Because they're defenseless. What can they do without you? Wisdom is defense. The fact that you carry the wisdom of God, you're the source of defense. Men will feel frail without you. They'll feel frail. They'll feel... Because you're not there. When you come, I'm talking about you. Everything stands. Everything stands. Everything stands. That is why when Paul is speaking about, I think it's in uh, Philippians 3, about 20, the 20th verse. He, he speaks of our conversation that is in heaven. From whence also, he says, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall, listen, change our vile body that it may be fashioned like and unto the glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. He's able to subdue all things unto himself. That means everything that surrounds this world, Christ is able to put it under, to get its attention and its submission to him. Now, when you have the truth, do you know what happens? Everything is subdued to you. Eh. Everything is subdued to you. I believe that some of you are working in companies, but in a few months, a few years, you're going to realize that your bosses will be subdued to you. That's the order of the Spirit. That's the order of the Spirit. He tells him, anoint Hazael. Because he shall be king over what? Syria. Anoint, there's another guy he talked about. And then he says, and anoint Elisha. And he says, whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, who shall kill? Jehu, right? And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. You see, he comes from physical things to spiritual men. He says, when the men of the world fail, now they call us. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. If the son of Nimshi fails, the son of Shaphat can. Why? Because he's simply saying that that is the order of the spirit. When the men of the world try it, and then they fail, they go to men who are higher of covenant. When they fail, they look for a certain other person. That is me. Put your name there. And that is how the spirit world is too. There are certain men God has placed that way. He says, this can be subdued. But if it fails on this one, this one can fix it. And it fail, if it fails on this one, this other one can fix it. Now, also comes with a responsibility. You, you see, there are people to whom we hand over the oracles. As, okay, let me say it again. Let me say it this way. There are people to whom faithful men hand over oracles. And there are men who hand over oracles to faithful men. <laughs> okay. There are people who receive business from men who do business. There are also men who give the men who do business business. I'm trying to explain what it means to be the head and not the tail. He says, and how be it? He says, we speak this wisdom to them which are mature. That they might what? Teach it to others also. He says, yet when we are among the full grown, now Paul is saying we are among the full grown, spiritually mature Christians who are ripe in understanding. He says, we do impart a higher wisdom. He's talking to a certain group of guys. Who to whom they impart a higher wisdom, the knowledge of the divine plan previously hidden. 
But it is indeed not a wisdom of this present age, or of this world, nor of the leaders, nor of the rulers of this age, who are being brought to nothing and are doomed to pass away. That's not the kind of wisdom they pass. You see? But they pass it to a certain group of guys. And these guys also pass it to another group of guys. Now, being the head means God first downloads to you. And then you impart it into mature guys. And those mature guys also download it to the immature. Choose where you belong. Ask your neighbor, choose your spot. Tell your neighbor, choose your spot. He said you're the head and not the tail. He said you are above and not beneath. That's where we are. I want to believe with you that as a nation we've taken a mandate to impart to them which are mature this wisdom. You're a pastor to pastors, an apostle to apostles, a preacher to preachers, a worshiper to worshippers, a businessman to businessmen, an administrator to administrators, a CEO to CEOs. You are heir to all. That is how we rule this world. Me, I believe it with every fiber of my being. I don't look at what is surrounding me. That is temporal. It's temporal. It's temporal. The things you see, they are only but for a moment. But the things that are not seen, they are called eternal. And that's where excellence is. He says, for I have made the eternal excellences. And so when Paul is speaking of that weight, he says, not that I've attained, but I seek that I may apprehend that which Christ apprehended me for. Why did you arrest me? You see, there are men who are trying to arrest God. They are trying to get him. And there are men who God got. <laughs> That's why we used to sing the song of Your love never fails, never leaves. And never. Your love never fails, never leaves. Why? Because me, Jesus, you. Okay, let me speak about you. There are men who are asking, they are trying to touch the heart of the Father. And there are men the Father is holding. He literally holds in his very bosom. And he says, all you want, you're mine. You belong to me. Be funny all you want, I'll still bring you back. Why? Because I have a covenant with you. You can't die early. You can't fail. You can't misapprehend. It's only a matter of time. Even if things around you don't seem like they're working. I have everything working. Why? Because all things work together for good. To them that love him. And to them that are called according to his purposes. Don't consider the things that are surrounding you. Imagine Paul waking up every morning and they are beating him. He would have thought, God, why are they beating me for what is true? When Jesus was on the cross, one time I saw a conversation of men saying, if he's the son of God, because he always wanted to disqualify the sonship. I mean the devil. Remember when he's tempting him? If you are the son of God. Right? He's on the cross. If you are the son of God. Do you realize that he, he causes you to doubt your identity in the hardest times? When you're in the wilderness, he tells him if you are the son of God. When he's healing the sick, he's away. When he's raising dead men, he's away. When the blind eyes are seeing, he's away. When the deaf ears are hearing, he's away. When cancers are living, he's away. When HIV is living bodies, he's away. When the man is in the wilderness, he says, if you are a son of God. Now, after healing and raising Jairus' daughter and multitudes, he says, John says the things Jesus did, if they were to be written, the books would fill this earth. And after doing all of those marvelous things, he gets on the cross. And again, the same spirit comes and says, if you are the son of God. And you realize that in all of those instances, Jesus never tried to prove. Because he knew he was. So, some of you are in a certain form of cross. You're asking, eh, did I believe the right God? Uh, am I really born again? If I am, why are things going the wrong way? Don't ever say that nonsense again. 
Don't ever get it out of your mouth. There are people who have gone through much more. The Bible says, no temptation that has befallen you, except that which is common to man. But it says, but God is able with the very temptation to forge a way through. What you think is going to kill you is the same thing going to give you life. I don't know whether I'm speaking to somebody. Have you seen people they have fired from jobs and then they went and became successful people? If they had not fired them, thank God for those people. Start to thank God for the people who fired you. For people who speak evil about you. For people who hate you. Some, there are some people who are saying, again, uh, I went there, yo. No, listen. Tell your neighbor, I know who I am. Tell your neighbor again, I know who I am. I know who I believed. It's only a matter of time. I'll bounce up again. That guy was looking at a certain car maker. And his slogan was, the power to surprise. Something like, the power to surprise. I said, yeah, this is it. The power to surprise. And that is why I speak upon your life. You're going to be a surprise. You are going to surprise me. When they think you're through, you come out of the other side. When they think you've ended here, you flip out of the other side. When they think you're dead, you come out raised again. They don't even know how. And God will change you so that you'll come back to the very men you ate with and they won't be able to recognize you. Can you believe Jesus disappeared for three days only? And when the man... That's the thing. I want God to do something in you. That after three days, men look at you and they can't believe that you're the one. I, I don't want something that can still connect you to who you were. I want something in my life that when men look at me, they say, no, I never knew this guy. I never knew this guy. I never knew this woman. He could not have changed that much. God could not have blessed her that far. No way. There is something that is different. So by the time Paul says, I am dead, but yet I live, yet not I, he got to a point where he was so metamorphosed that when you looked at the man, you couldn't believe it was Paul anymore. It was Jesus himself. Are you understanding what I'm saying? You get to a point. I don't want God to change me. And I look like an improved me. I want God to do something in my life that when men look at me, they won't recognize me. Oh, Rabba Kotele. Sabakata Rabba Koye. Rende Rebo Zibakaya. Rekoteleba. That is what I believe. That is what I believe. Tell anybody that is what I believe. Tell him though that is what I believe. He says it's given to us to know. That means we have the divine ability to receive apocalypse. It's not something we even question about and say, God, I didn't understand. Today, if you're here and you say I didn't understand, you're lying, you did. Why? Because it is given unto you. Because, listen, the Holy Spirit has accorded the order of truth to have contingencies above others. That is why, for example, when he's talking about the facets of the seed, the farmer who sowed the seed on stony ground, on dry ground, in, in thorny and stuff, he says, for if you don't understand this parable, he says, you won't, how will you understand the rest? Because by the order of contingency, that parable opens up mystery. He says to them which hear us, he says, it is given unto you to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without all these things are done in parables. Everything seems mysterious. 
He looks like cultic. They don't get it. Why? Because it's not given to them. But to you it is given. It is given. That's when after that, he started to explain to them the parable. I have it in a sermon called the four facets of hearing. Receive it. Because once you understand that parable, every other mystery in parable will be revealed to you. Every. Why? Because it's not what you had. It's how you had it. God calls Elijah out of the tent of meeting. Shoo. And then tells him, go he, out of the cave, right? And then he says, I'm coming. And the Lord sends a fire. And Elijah says, I think this is God. But he says, oh, God was not in the fire. The wind comes. God is not in the wind. And you see God send elements. And to some people, they would have looked at those elements and said, that is God. But then, it wasn't God. And the Bible says, and in a still small voice, the Bible says, he had a still small voice and God came through it. Are you hearing me? But the language through which it was spoken could not be translated through human language. No. In fact, the Bible says, he feared and then ran out. Let's read. And it was so, when Elijah had, let's go from the verse before, verse before. And after the, begin from 11, I think. He says, and he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. The Lord was not in the earthquake. And he says, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah had it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him that said, What dost thou do here, Elijah? Now, the voice that tells him what I'm doing here is different from the one he had inside. The one he had inside did not carry any human language to be interpreted. He never inter... Talk about comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Something dropped into Elijah's spirit. He ran out. Why? Because he had something that the human language cannot explain. But therein was God. Then the other one starts asking. That one he could interpret. Now, if you're a scholar of the Bible, you'd have thought, if the voice before said something distinctive enough for Elijah to put in language, he would have spoken it and said, at first inside I had a voice. Or the writer would have told us, the first voice inside said so. But there comes a point where Paul tells you, I know of a man. Not, and I don't know whether in the flesh or in the spirit. But he says, but I know of a man. And he says, he was taken up. He says, give me the amplifier. He says, and I knew such a man. I know that this man, whether in the body or away from the body, I don't know. It was too distinctively deep for Paul. That when that experience came, he didn't know whether he was in the body or not. Some people say, I was carried in the spirit. But what Paul went through, he was not sure whether he was still in the body. No, listen, he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, he said, I don't know. God knows. Because I was caught up in the third heaven. And he says, and I know that this man, whether in the body or away from the body, I do not know. God knows. He says, was caught up into paradise and he had utterances beyond the power of a man to put in two words, which man is not permitted to utter. That's what the, that's the stuff he had. He, it was beyond him to articulate whether he was in the body or not. It was beyond the power of human. Human language has power. The other voice has a power above the language of men. He says he had something. And he says the human man, the human being could not put into words. There was no power for human language to articulate it. And Paul says, I had that thing. And then you wake up in the morning and you're walking among men who have not had anything. And you think that you're going to fail. You have something. Hey. Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. 
He says, we have this ministry. And he says, for which cause we faint not. That's the reason why we don't give up. Because there are things God revealed to us that we can't put them in human language. But they are inside. We also don't know why we find ourselves praying. We also don't know why we find ourselves on the streets. We don't know why we find ourselves in taxis. We don't know why we sit late at night preaching the gospel. Why we reach out to souls and tell them, come and hear. We also don't know why. We lost part of our private lives. But there's something inside. We don't have words to describe it. It's digging us and killing us every other day. Man, that's not us here. Way late at night. And I saw guys going up, putting up lights. And I said, these guys are educated. They're supposed to be home. But what drives them? You're not paying them any cent. And they love what they're doing. And they do it every day. They do it every day. After here, you're going to be going home. They're going to tear down everything. You don't know where, how, who is the last guy is going to, who, who the last guy is, who's going to leave this place and what time they're going to leave. And they're going to go back with joy. Why? Because there's something they have inside. It's there. They, they don't have a language for it. But it causes them. It causes them. It causes them. It causes them. Give us a few years. Give us a few years. I think that's the one thing they don't understand about us. These guys do everything with their own hands. You understand? Just give it a few years. You'll understand what people are getting. And, and this is what is humbling me most. God is revealing himself to men. Privately. Privately. Now, do you know the grace of walking into things that are defenseless and naked before you? You don't only have the access to them, but they have an attraction to you. God arrested you for a purpose. There are some people who still go to church because, yeah, he's moving. There are some people who go to church because they want to touch a certain heart in God. And there are certain people who go to the presence of God because they can't run anymore. Tell your neighbor, I'm, I'm a prisoner, I'm arrested. So, every time Paul made this personal pastor to always ask, why did you apprehend me? Why did you anoint me? Why me? Why are you talking to me? Why are you revealing these things to me? Why did you pour the Holy Ghost on me? Why me? Why am I reading the Bible this way? Why, why am I listening to what I'm... Why me? Why not any other person? Why didn't I live before your coming? Why did I live after your coming? Why did you, of all men in this world right now, why am I the one right now in your presence? Why am I seeking your face on a cold day? Why don't I have a choice but to be here? He must have a reason. I said he must have a reason. And then I started to realize this as I'm finishing. That to many, Christ was a revelation. But to some, he was just somebody they knew about. That is why we preach the grace message. Because the grace message is Christ revealed as he is. Are you hearing me? The essence of the grace of God is the ultimate experience to walk in the spirit without being veiled in sight all the things that God reveals being veiled. It's, my eyes could be closed, but the things are unveiled. Oh, my eyes could be open, but the things are veiled. And he says, but in Christ the veil is done away with. There's something I was meditating about one day about this thing we call, and as we behold, like in a glass. Right? Like in a mirror. The glory of God. Right? I start to realize that when I went in that place of beholding like in a glass or the mirror, the glory of God, there was no full-bodied entity of God standing in front of that mirror for me to behold. It was me. 
I don't know that you understand what I'm saying. That is why at a particular point in Revelation, the Son becomes Him, you see. And they don't understand that when you get into, when you become a child of God and you become born again, everything in the scriptures defines you in Him and Him in you. So, when he says, and as we behold the glory of God like in a mirror, we are not on the side seeing him standing before that mirror. No, it was actually us standing before that mirror. That means the more we get to know who we are in him and who he is in us, the glory of God starts to increase upon our lives. When you look in the mirror, you must see glory. You must see yourself like he sees you. This is love made perfect that we might have confidence on that day. He says, for us he is, so are we in this world. That's the thing that energizes me. And I feel a little pain and I say, stupid you, how can I be sick? And it goes. That's the thing that makes me wake up to believe I cannot fail in this life. I don't look at the things temporal. I look at the things eternal. God wired you eternally before anything ever came into being. You can recreate whatever has failed because you carry the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the author and finisher of all things. He is inside you. That's why our greatest quest is to know Him like we ought. Like we ought. Like we ought. Because we are moving into a grace where every other day things are defenseless. Everything you find must be able to serve you. Everything you stumble on will serve your occasion. Doors will open in your life. Things will happen in your life. And you will look back and say, This is God. It can't be me. It can't be me. It can't be me. Somebody speak in other tongues. The power of God is here. The power of God is here. Come on, speak in other tongues. Speak. If you don't have tongues, speak in your language. I have no other God but you. I have no other God but you. Can you create something in a few minutes? Create your world in just a few minutes. As the you will do what no man can do. Come on, speak another tongue. I have no other but you. I have no other but you. you Father, I thank you because of the impartation that somebody is receiving this evening. I decree that my life cannot be the same again. I decree that you're opening great things to me. You're revealing great things to us in the name of Jesus. Our lives cannot be the same again. I have a testimony. I have a story. I have a destiny. And it's tuned up in you. In Jesus' mighty name. I want you to give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise.
Come on, clap for Jesus. Listen, if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, I want you to walk here and we lead you into a confession prayer. Saints, give me only two minutes. Don't move. The people who are going to get born again might be stumbled by you. And they also move out. Come on. If you want to give your life to Christ, come. Come here and say, I want to be born again today. I want to be born again today. Come. You will do. You're coming? God bless you. Anybody else? Ask your neighbor. Are you born again? Come here. Come on, clap for Jesus. Clap for Jesus. Clap for Jesus. Clap for Jesus. If you want to accept the Lord as your Savior, come. God bless you. God bless you. And they are coming. Clap for them. Clap for them. Clap for them. Clap for them. Anybody else? Anybody else? Are they over? Are there more coming? Come and accept Jesus. More are coming. Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe with my heart. I confess with my mouth that you died and rose again. From today, I accept you as Savior and Lord of my life. From today, I am born again. Amen. Somebody clap for Jesus. Clap for Jesus. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.